In today's episode, Everything Worlds 2017, I'll be giving away a 2x2x3 cube from Chi Yi Mofangi, and I'll be joined by Cuber Cube to help me out with today's podcast. Hey, Shani from SpeedCubeReview.com. This is Speed Cube Review Podcast Episode 10. Episode 9 was last week's little mini one. I didn't want to do like episode 8.5 or anything. So yeah, this is episode 10. We're going to go through some results from the World Championship, and then we are going to go into questions with Cuber Cubed joining me to help answer them. We're also going to go over the new Rubik's GAN collaborative puzzle, which I was going to talk about at the beginning, then forgot about it, so I bring it up in the middle of one other question. I'm going to be giving away a 2x2x3 Tara Cube from Chi Yi, so make sure you pay attention to the podcast, and there'll be a question at speedcubeview.com slash podcast to enter later on. Now, this is actually my fifth time recording this because my computer keeps turning the fan on, which is messing up with the microphone, and then I recorded with the wrong microphone, and yeah, so hopefully I can finish this up. Now, all the different names from Worlds, I'm probably going to butcher, so I apologize for that. I'm going to go to Cube Comps, just kind of work my way up from the bottom. Now, Cube Comps has been a little sketchy with announcing what the world records are and things like that, so I'm going to try to remember most of those as I go through this, but let's start with Multi-Blind. Now, Multi-Blind... Their first place was Siobhan Bensal, who got 37 out of 40. Second place went to Moscow, who got 40 out of 46. Now, they actually got the exact same result. The way that multiplying works is every po- every cube you get correct, you get a plus one, and every cube that was solved incorrectly, or I guess not solved, would be a minus one. And so they both actually got 34. The difference is Siobhan's time was 59 minutes and 12 seconds, while Mascow's time was 59 minutes and 27 seconds. So that 15 second difference was the reason that Mascow got second place and Siobhan got first place. 5x5 blindfold went to Tom Nelson from New Zealand, who got a new continental record of 5 minutes and 43 seconds. 4x4 blindfold went to Bill Wang from Canada, who also got a new continental record of 2 minutes and 9 seconds. Square one went to Jaden McNeil, who got a new continental record from Australia with a 10.07 average and a 7.47 single. Skew went to Lucas Belinga from Poland with a 2.86 average. Rubik's Clock went to Wozczek Not from Poland with a 6.31 average. And Pyraminx went to Drew Brads, who also got a new world record of 2.04 second average. So we're getting really close to a sub 2 second average on Pyraminx. Mega Minx went to Juan Pablo Juanqui from Peru with a 38.14 average. 3 by 3 feet went to Jacob Kippa with a 30.69 mean. 3 by 3 one-handed went to Max Park, who got a 10.31 average, which I believe was also a world record. Felix Zemdegs got 11.81 average, so a second, and Daniel Rosalvine took third with a 12.3 average. Furious Moves went to Marcel Peters with a 26.33 mean. Second and third went to Sebastiano Tronto and Matt Svalk with a 27.33. The 27.33 from Max Park from the Netherlands was a national record. Now for 3x3 blindfold, the first place went to Grzegorz Jolocha from Poland with a 24.86. Now that one I probably really did butcher because I don't know how to pronounce a GRZ sound at the beginning. Adam Barda I want to give a shout out to who took first place in round one and round two, setting a new national record of 21.10 for Hungary but ended up DNFing all three in the finals. This is where things really get crazy, because for a 7x7 in the first round, Felix set a new world record for the mean and the single, with a 2 minute 15 second mean and a 2 minute second single, which means we're getting dangerously close to a sub 2 minute single for a 7x7. He also ended up winning the final round as well. For a 6x6, Felix again in round 1 broke the world record mean and best with a minute 27 and a minute 20, and then Kevin Hayes won the final round for 6x6. 5x5, five five, Felix won the final round, but also in the second round, set a new world record average and best of 46.24 and 38.52. For 4x4, four four, the, the winner of 4x4 four four was Sebastian Weir with a 24.15 and a 19.79. Bill Wang came in second, set a new national record of 24.91 and a continental record of 20.69. And Felix Zemdex came in third with a 25.04 and a 21.47. For 2x2, Anthony Pederekis from Greece took first with a 1.72 second average, and Chris Olsen came in second with a 1.77 second average. 
Now for three by three, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the controversy yet. We're gonna talk about that later on, but I wanna talk about the first round. Kian Mansour took first place. He's from Canada. He set a new national record of 6.86. The big thing about that uh, is that Felix came in second. He came in first in the first round, but he solves with Rue method. And everyone online was going crazy who solves Rue, saying that Rue's taking over, or at least that Rue is a viable option for getting fast times. He did not make it past the second round, but let's go on to the final round where we have Max Park being the new 2017 world champion at a 6.85 second average. And actually from what I've heard that that average as well as the one from the first round were the only two sub seven second averages at Worlds. I don't know, I haven't looked this up myself, but that's what I have heard. Second place went to Song Hyuk Nam from Korea with a 7.02 second average. Third place went to Lucas Eder with a 7.24 second average. Felix Zemdegs took fourth with a 7.28, and Bill Wang took fifth with a 7.55. So that's pretty much it for the times. We'll talk about the issue with the timer in the finals for 3x3 later on, so stick around for that. We're going to move on to the second half of the show with Cuber Cubed. Hey, so we're here with Cuber Cubed. He's got a YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me. No problem. It's great to be here. Yeah, so before we get into Worlds and, and all of that stuff, uh, you went to Nationals. I could not go to Nationals. Um, we actually live kind of near each other, so it yeah. would have been a nice, easy drive for me, but I just had to work. So um, I already went through all the records and stuff like that, but what was your favorite part about Nationals? Well, kind of meeting everybody that you've either seen online, whether it's YouTube or uh, Fast Cubers, um, and seeing them in person. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all that's really cool and talking to them and you know seeing Chris Olson or the cubologist or you know other youtubers that's really cool and kind of talking to them and just the community is really cool yeah I the last competition Chris Olson was there and I, I like I timed him for a couple of solves and in my mind I'm like I'm timing Chris Olson like yeah. but then I realized like he's probably not that it, super excited that if anyone's time <laughs> like super yeah. pumped about it yeah um, but then i start having this freak out like i better not mess anything up and it's like yeah i'm like definitely. standing completely still as he solves a two by two in um, one second yeah. Um, yeah so did you get a chance to watch anything from worlds yet um i i didn't actually watch the actual live stream live but um, I did some recap, and I watched some finals and some events and stuff like that. Yeah, I um, I watched a little bit live, but it wasn't as exciting. I wanted to see some of those big ones. And um, I think the biggest thing... So bef I, before we go into the actual final finals of 3x3, three three, yes. um, the, the first round of 3x3 three three had some quite interesting thing happen. Uh, Kian Mansour, Mansour got first place with an average national record, uh, 6.86 for Canada, but he uses Rue. And all of a sudden, everyone online was freaking out that Rue is now, like, the big thing. Now, he ended up getting... Really? Uh, yeah, he uses Rue, and he, he, so he got first in the first round, and uh, Felix got second, and so suddenly everyone's like, wait, Rue is beating Felix. Um, and yeah, he ended up not making it past round two, uh, but at, he had like an eight second average, but it, it was like 90 second points in round two, so it was ridiculous. Um, have you ever tried Rue? I haven't. Well, I guess I have. So basically how it went was, hey, I've been using CFOP for a long time. Let me try Rue. 15 minutes later, I'm going to go back to what I know. <laughs> I... Um, yeah, like, because I did a month of it, and that was probably the hardest thing with that is it's so intuitive-based for that first couple blocks. That's what uh, I hear. Yeah, like, and because it's so intuitive-based, like, the, people say don't stick to doing F2L. Like, don't put an edge in, and then the, the corners, and, like, don't do that. But it's such a lower move count. Like, I think it's, like, 45 average or something. But it's, oh. that part is, like, the really awkward part of getting that first block in. But... Um, yeah, so I guess Rue is viable now. I would have loved to have seen it uh, go all the way to the final round, but, yeah. um, let's, let's talk about the final thing. So if, um, kind of recap of what happened, there's, I, I can't pronounce his name, I'm, hopefully I'm pronouncing sort of close, uh, Sung Hyuk Nam, um, when he hit the timer for his first solve, it reset. 
I, I don't think we know if like the battery compartment got like hit too hard or it looks like his thumb might have hit the reset button. I tried watching in like slow motion. And yeah, me looks, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so there's this big discussion over, you know, should he have? Because if they counted that solve, it would have been maybe just like a low six, like 6.1, which would yeah. have gotten him first place place but then that changes the whole timeline because if he got that his nerves might have been different and all this other stuff um so first i guess i'm just gonna kind of put out there people need to stop making like you know max's world championship not as meaningful like he he worked hard for that but there's a few options people have some thought about about fixing this one is just putting um o-rings which is like a little rubber ring over the reset button so it's more Mm like uh not concave but we'll, we'll say sculpted <laughs> it's sculpted <laughs> now. it's uh, an x-man sculpted timer we so that's the other thing just getting a different though the speed sex timers are i think are fine like i have never had any resets at home um me neither but they obviously have happened and do happen at competitions so yes i mean if we have uh new timers I mean, that's a whole... Either Speedstacks needs to do something, or we need to really get a whole different company on this. But um, I guess this is a very general, broad question. Do you have any thoughts on this? Of the whole controversy? Um, I guess the controversy on, like... Um, mainly, what what should be done like should it be a rule change should it be should it just be as is and that's what you know that's cubing it's you've got those weird technicalities and stuff so what i think should happen is personally i think that there should be like those those o-rings secured on the timer uh i mean and it's not only a thing where it's like oh you have to mod it just for cubing where speed stacks the actual thing it doesn't matter i feel like that i mean people are still putting their hands on the timer same Mm -hmm. either way so maybe that should be implemented in the timer because what it seemed like i i went through it frame by frame and what it seemed like is i don't think personally he hit the reset Mm -hmm. because when he had his hands down if you can see on the on the uh, frame by frame, he had his hands down and the time was on. Mm-hmm. The second he took his hands off, it reset. Hmm. So I don't know if that's if he reset it, but if you have your hands still on it, it stays until you take your hands off or yeah. something. But it seems like it would be a timer malfunction maybe with the battery compartment but it's very very um you know very strange that this happened and i i personally think that oh excuse me uh, i personally think that um there should be o-rings on all the timers because that would prevent something like this from happening because if it's so hard to reset it and this still happens you can easily diagnose it as a timer malfunction. Yeah. Have you ever seen the World Championship, the, like, 1983, I think it was? Have you ever watched the videos for that? Oh, like the the first nationals, or first worlds? Yeah. Uh, I saw, I've seen, like, the popular clip of the the person getting, like, the 22nd solve. Yeah, they, so their timers were, it was a... uh, a sensor that when the cube was placed down it would stop the timer like the cube itself stopped it yeah and it was battery operated too because i guess they had a power failure or power issue in the building but the timer still worked so they could keep going with that and um i was part of me was thinking that could work but like um there was sometime recently at either a competition or i saw it was felix actually the the cube kind of like fell out of his hands and as when he stopped it and so it like rolled off the mat, um, which everyone's mm-hmm. like, oh, is that a DNF? He's like, no, it's it's still <laughs> solve. It's just off the yeah. mat. So that would then be another technicality though, where it's like, it, would the timer stop if it landed and then rolled off? Like, it, there's more issues there then, or if they accidentally hit the timer and then probably couldn't share tables because the timer might be too sensitive. So every thought I've mm-hmm. had about ways of adjusting the timer function is just, I can't figure out the mm-hmm. best way of doing it. 
Yeah, because on one side it's like, well, if it initially hits the table and then or it hits the, where the mat is and then rolls off, would it stop initially? But I've even personally had this happen where I'm solving, someone pulls up their chair and shakes the whole table. Mhm. And I don't would that stop my time? Yeah. Would that get, you know, me an extra solve or what would happen? Would it be competitor's fault or would it just be a extra solve for you, you know, type of thing? So it's a very big gray area in what would make it better. But um, I think that, you know, something that needs to happen, whether that's more secure battery compartment mm -hmm. or um, rules on not hitting the timer so hard, where even if you don't reset it and if you hit it super hard – I, I don't know. That's also a gray area. So, but yeah. you know, what's what's too hard? What's too light? You know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But or, you know, all the timers needing O rings on it. I think that's a really good way yeah, of doing that's, it. Yeah, that's really cheap. I actually think um, at like all the Michigan comps, they all have the O rings, and I think it's just like mm -hmm. clear tape that's holding them down. Yeah, just um, like scotch, you know, scotch tape that you yeah. can you know tape anything with. Just tape down the O-rings. And I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, scotch tape, it makes it hard to reset it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, <laughs> th that makes it, you know, it doesn't need to be super professional looking or whatever. It just needs to stop you from resetting it until you actually need to. Yeah. I, so. I actually just now, I just opened up uh, the battery compartment for the my G4 timer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's no like, because a lot of battery compartments I've seen have foam inside yes. of it. These do not. It's just the plastic. So I'm going to uh, stick a piece of paper in there, like a little <laughs> tissue paper, just to hold that down more. Yeah. Because um, that might huh. also, I'd, although I don't really know what the big issue was, if it was battery or if it was somehow the time, the reset button being hit or just something internally that just glitched. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they did. They did first give them an extra solve, but I think they're counting it as a DNF now. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's official times. It still says the time on cube comps, but I'm fairly certain they're giving them a DNF at this point because they looked back and realized it should have been a DNF from the start. Oh, really? Why? Um, just if the timer resets, like if it goes... Like there's, there's a certain glitch that happens where the timer will go to like 0 0.06. I don't know exactly the rule, but if it does that, it's obviously a timer issue and they uh -huh. can blame the timer and they can say, okay, you get an extra solve. But because of this, because it's, you know, they don't know exactly what could happen or what happened, it's, they have to kind of do a DNF because I think if they left it open, if they left it as you get an extra solve, someone might be able to exploit it where if they're not liking the solve, they could like accidentally yeah. do that. So I think it's, it's almost a, uh, they have to do that just to make it out of mm -hmm. fairness of someone not exploiting it. Yeah. That, that makes sense because, you know, obviously with, if it was not to have O rings, I know I'm talking about O rings all the time. Like it's the best thing since sliced bread or something, <laughs> but, um, you know, if it had O ring, O ring, or if it didn't, you know, oh, I'm getting a bad solve, just strategically place it down and accidentally hit your thumb, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. Oh, timer malfunction. And the, you know, I'm I'm not trying to gripe on community judges because there are some really good ones. But, mm -hmm. but you know, at some comps when it's like we need judges, then some ju some kids just do it and they, they don't really pay attention. So that could easily slip. Yeah. Uh... So... And I just realized, for people who don't know what O-rings are, it's it's literally just a rubber ring. They just call it an O-ring because it looks like an O. Um, there, There's a lot of different very reasons for them, but um, one thing if you have, like, a, a hose, if you look inside of, like, the, the screw part is sometimes you see a little, like, reddish or, like, a black rubber ring, and that's that's an O-ring. Um, but mm -hmm. it'd be the smaller size that would fit the, the timer more. Yeah. But... Okay, so let's let's do some questions. So I think Worlds, you know, it's done. You know, I'm I'm not even gonna go in. Like Felix broke world records the first oh, couple yeah. days. I don't know if he just got got tired or. I mean, people are are really talking about that a lot about him getting fourth place at Worlds, but his times were decent. I mean, he got a couple eight second solves, but it's not like he choked or anything. Just other people yeah. are really good too. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, okay, some questions from the site. The first, very first thing we've got uh, Corbin from Idaho in America. And it says, what, he actually put America. So I have to make sure I say America. Really? It yes. said that? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, man. So what would you say is the hardest barrier in cubing has been so far? And how did you overcome it? So this is, I guess, very open-ended if it's talking about timing or just in general the barrier of cubing. And I just, my dog's kind of barking in the background. So hopefully that doesn't show through. Um, I am going to open this up to you first, if you don't mind. What? Um. <laughs> or I can go so, and you can think about it. But yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I, I think I have an answer. I, I, I've gotten a very similar question uh, about this. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going to do this in speed to speed solving okay. because I mainly speed solve. So probably the hardest barrier for cubing with me was, I mean, if I look at my CS timer, I have um, probably the probably the um the sub 20 mark mm -hmm. or the or the sub like the the right below sub 20 like i was at 18 and 17 mm -hmm. for so long nearly half of my solves on cs timer since i've had such a like i have over 10,000 solves on CF, cs timer so i can i can see from when i was 45 seconds to now mm -hmm. and most of my half of the solves are from 15 seconds to 20 seconds. So it's, I remember that like 18 second mark for some reason for me was super hard. 20 seconds was also really hard, but I mean, that was probably the hardest barrier. And that's when I started learning full PLL or mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All, uh, all 21 algs of PLL. So, I kind of realized then it's like I really need to work on actual things like look ahead and PLL and OLL because just solving it and waiting to naturally progress mm -hmm. is going to take a lot longer. So I, I kind of thought I need to kind of I need, I need to do this instead of just learning to look OLL and to look PLL. So I, I dedicated a ton of time and then it was still slowly but surely and then I got you know, got faster and stuff. So that was probably the hardest for me. And it, I mean, it really takes a lot of dedication because it's really easy to say, you know, I just give up. I'm not getting faster and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, it, it was hard, but I got through it. <laughs> yeah. For me, I mean, even as far as times, I remember around that 17, 18 second time. Um, but like right now, my average, I was just checking my times, my average of a thousand is actually slightly lower than my current average of a hundred that I'm doing. So that's when you know you've, it's getting harder when, you know, the times are not decreasing, decreasing very much. I, I was going to say, you know, whatever my current time is, is my biggest barrier, but I think my biggest barrier is, I'm going to go more, more philosophical, is not caring what my times are anymore. Mm, I mean, I still yeah. have moments where it's like, oh man, like, I just want to beat this time. Like I've got, yeah. or like, like yeah. I've got a few sub 10 solves and now I'm just like, mm. so there's some days it's like, Oh, I just want another sub 10. solve. <laughs> I, just... I know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the zone some days mm -hmm. and I'm getting, you know, I'm getting 11s and 12s and 13s and I'm just like, I can feel a sub 10, you know, a hundred solves later. I, I'm not getting it. Yeah. Kind of and I, um, I, Around it was right after I got my first sub ten solve that when I really convinced myself that I need to stop caring what my times are because there's gonna get a barrier where you know I don't think I'm ever gonna get as fast as fast as like Max's or Felix I might but I don't think that that's that's in my my line of sight right now and yeah. so being able to spend a month on ZZ and then a month on Rue and then a month just doing like FMC solves and then going to color neutral has kind of forced me to take a step back and be like, okay, you know, I'm just having some fun with this. But yeah. there's still those moments where I get overly frustrated and I need to kind of take a step back again and be like, okay, stop caring so much about this. Because yeah. there's, um, I don't know if I've told this story, but I'm not, I'm going to leave the name out of it in case that person's actually listened to this. But I, I was told a story, it was a parent of a, a cuber that I know and, and, 
um, they walked by his room and they like heard him kind of like pounding on the desk, like out of frustration and, and being really angry. And he's like, what's going on? And he goes, I, I can't beat my record. And he was like literally just freaking out, stressing out because he couldn't wow. beat his record. And, and it's like, well, yeah, the more times you like the, the kind of the better your record is, the harder it's going to be to beat. And yeah, like I, when I started cubing, I remember too, it was almost once a week, at least I was beating what my record time was. Oh, wow. and I think it was when I got around like the mid twenties when it started not to be once a week. And then once I got to like, I think I, I almost had the same record actually. Yeah. If I don't break my, my record by like mid August, I think that'll be a year that I will have the same record. So that's, that's fun. (laughs) So, okay. The next question we have, uh, Phyong, P H U O N G from Vietnam asks, uh, well, actually I'm just going to answer this one. What should I do if I get water in my cube? You should open it up and wipe it out. Um, unless you like the feeling of it. (laughs) I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, don't think the the screws or springs are gonna rust that bad unless you're like swimming with it. Yeah, just just clean it out. Yeah, I mean, even if you like take a water bottle and and dump it in there, if you just like if you just take it apart, wipe it off. I mean, the the worst that could happen to it is like you said, you know, the rusting of the the screws and springs. But that'll take that'll take some time. Yeah, that's so, not like an overnight it's like, thing. Like, oh no, I have water in my cube you know, freak out, do it really quick. It's like, no, you just need to take it apart and clean it out. And, you know, it's good to go. It's not acid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not WD-40. Yes. Do not use WD-40 in your cube. Although they have a silicone WD-40, and I'm really curious. I want to, like, get it and try it. Oh, um, I, so... <laughs> I, have a, I, I still have nightmares. <laughs> um, okay, this is kind of a, a little story. It says, have you ever been called a genius or a genius or a nerd? by um, a completely random person and says a little story me and two of my friends were on a train from a competition and there were two there were some women there who looked at us and talked to us about the cube um and when they walked i'm trying to read this it okay i'm going to paraphrase it looks like the two women said uh you guys are straight up heroes and it was pretty awesome since they were uh people who we didn't know okay so i guess they're asking have you cubed in public and gotten any weird attention or called genius or nerd by random people? Um, I haven't personally. I've, I've had situations where, you know, I'm in public and someone's like, whoa, you know, and it gives, gives that look where that's crazy. Uh, but I've never really gotten approached because I don't really cube that much in public unless mm-hmm. I'm like, currently at a competition and i'm going to lunch or something Mm -hmm. i don't i'm not the type of person where it's like oh i'm a cuber so i'm going to the grocery store let's take my (laughs) three by three i do that (laughs) (laughs) i mean personally i just don't because as a teenager during the summer Mm -hmm. i mean i have all the time in the world to practice my three by three so Mm uh you know I, i just don't feel like i need to or whatever so i don't really get approached for that but Mm -hmm. you know i've gotten some looks like whoa that's crazy yeah no like i usually have a cube on me but i'm not like randomly cubing in public so it's not like that but i i don't like cubing in public and mainly it's the noise and getting looks like i feel like i can't focus um Mm. but and there have been whenever anyone has come up to me and and said something about like oh you must be good at math and part of me wants to say well yeah i kind of am but that's not the reason (laughs) like it's (laughs) Um, and cause usually whenever people say that I have to go into some sort of explanation, I go through how I solve it and kind of, I, I almost have the same speech every time where I first do the cross and I show that and I usually, you know, you could probably do the cross and these four pieces and, and they're like, yeah, I think I could do that. And then I show how with moving, you know, one side up 90 degrees, uh, and, you can manipulate the pieces and pair them up and I insert them. And then I usually show off a little bit. And it's like, and then it's algorithms. And I close my eyes and do like OLL and then PLL. Um, yeah. But oh yeah, I did, that was Rick from the Netherlands. And actually another question from the Netherlands. 
Um, do you think the music you, and this is from Mark from the Netherlands, do you think the music you listen to while solving can make you quicker? For example, I like to listen to Dragon Force, which is really fast and energetic power metal band. So you think that listening to music like that can make a difference because it almost feels like my brain just works quicker when I listen to, for example, classical music. So do you think it has an effect? Um, I'll go first. As far as Dragon Force, ever since Guitar Hero 3, I cannot... I cannot do Dragon Force anymore. <laughs> that that got me out of Guitar Hero. Um, <laughs> I do sometimes. Like, if I have um, headphones on, sometimes I'll even just listen to podcasts. I'm more of zoning out, but it's it's allowing me to just eliminate any other things from the room. Sometimes with its music... Like, it's funny. Music I am more involved with. And especially if it's a classical piece, I'm like, oh, there's there's a bassoon part there. And there's a, and I'm like yeah. listening to the parts. When it's podcast, I can kind of zone off. But um, I think it does help. I try not to do it because I don't want to get used to it where I have to listen to music because then when you go to a comp, you you can't listen to music while you're at a competition solving a cue. Yep. Um, have you ever listened to music or do you do that? Oh, yeah, all the time. I think it's personally, uh, my opinion, it could be totally wrong. I'm not the, you know, next Chris Tran or anything, but um, <laughs> uh, I feel like it's more of a mind distractor mm -hmm. than kind of like makes it go faster because I feel that when I don't have like something taking my, you know, like some of my attention, kind of like music, mm -hmm. I'm constantly overthinking the cube. Yeah. But like, I know how to solve th the Rubik's cube. I've solved it in, you know, nine seconds before. So I'm obviously, you know, I obviously know how to do this. So it's just not overthinking it and just doing what I know how to do. So I think music, at least for me, kind of helps me not overthink it and just helps me just do it. And at, I'm, you know, 13s are a, you know, a, a mediocre solve for me. They're not, they're not like fantastic, but they're not super bad. They're, you know, that's what I average. Mm -hmm. And there was a point when I was averaging 14.5 and this solve felt slow because I wasn't going super fast and I, I wasn't thinking about it too much, but I got a low 13 because I wasn't overthinking it and thinking, oh, this is a good solve. I can't mess this up and all of this and that. So I think it's kind of a, you know, distractor in some sorts. Yeah, I know what you're saying. There was actually, uh, yesterday, Felix Zemdegs posted a picture with Max Park, and it just had a quote from Max Park that says, Don't think, just solve. Max Park, mm -hmm. 2017 world champ. Um, so, <laughs> it, I, yeah, the, the whole idea of, of not thinking, I, like, right now I'm in this point where I really have to, like, think, but my thinking is is telling my brain not to think like it's i feel like yeah. it's when i attempt to do any sort of meditation stuff i'm like stop thinking stop that you're thinking sean stop thinking stop thinking about yeah. stuff <laughs> so it's it's kind of like that um so let's go on to uh amelia from there's no location just ask how did you start cubing so i'll ask you first how did you start cubing well it was a uh sunny day in april 2012 <laughs> <laughs> um so it was actually 2012, though, five years ago. Um, and my dad, at his work, there was this take your kid to work day. So I go, and he has this coworker just across the room. And, you know, they know each other really well, and his coworker brought his son. And, uh, by the way, his coworker is absolutely wicked smart. And his, you know, son's there, and he has uh, a Shang Shao three by three and uh, Shang Shao five by five. So um, I was like, "Oh, that's really cool!" Because I've never ever seen like a Rubik's cube. Someone solving it. I've seen a mm -hmm. Rubik's cube, but I've, that was the first time I've actually seen someone solve it. And uh, I just remember, you know, him him, you know, turning the cube, and I said, "Man, you're so fast!" And he said, "Oh, I'm scrambling." <laughs> and so and then he solved it and then he timed it and i said whoa that is really fast 40 seconds and you know so it, it really inspired me i was like man i you know like any nom cuber it's like mm -hmm. you know minutes and minutes so it's like man i could probably do that so you know i asked my dad i said hey you know could i get one i've never had a rubik's cube he's like well you know 
sure, but in his mind, it's you know he's gonna give up. You know, it, you know mm-hmm. he has he has the non cuber thought too. You know, like oh, you know, you're just, you know yeah. that type of thing. But anyway, so uh, I did some research before we bought them, mm-hmm. and uh, I found we were going to get a Diane Guhon version two. Okay. Because uh, my dad's coworker recommended it in like a, a the Shengshao three by three, and actually my sister was with me, so uh, we got a white Shengshao three by three and a Diane Guhong. I was like, oh, I'll take the Guhong, and uh, it, I still have it in my collection, and it's so broken in, it's actually like good. Mm-hmm. I actually did a blindfolded guess your cube thingy on my yeah. own, and I thought my Guhong was a Hualong. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy, but anyway. So uh, I got it. I learned how to solve it in a couple days, and instantly hooked. I mean, yep. it, I I it was just like a it was one of those things. Like as a kid, it was always one week it's this, one week it's that. Moving on, moving on. One week it's this. Always getting stuff and loving all this, and then moving on. But like cubing was the first thing, pretty much that mm-hmm. like really stuck. Yeah, I. So. I've gone, uh, and that reminds me, I, there's a thing I forgot to talk about before we even get to the questions, but uh, I've gone over a couple times with how I started. Basically, I saw the Google Doodle uh, for the 40th anniversary, and I was like, I'm going to f- figure that thing out. And I, I bought a Rubik's Cube, and I did. Um, <laughs> that was long story short. But I've got to talk about the Rubik's Cube. So Gan and Rubik's kind of teamed up, and... And at first, okay, everyone kept talking about, oh, they're going to make a puzzle. And my resp- my reply was, they're not saying they're making a puzzle. They're just working together. Um, mm-hmm. But it seems that they have made a puzzle. And the couple of times I've talked about it, it looks like a GAN 356. But it's a little bit different. Have you checked this, checked this out yet? Uh, I don't personally have one, but I have seen it. Uh, not in person, but I've seen it online. <laughs> have you No, know, I mean the new one that just that they showed at Worlds. The, uh, the Gan Rubik's, right? Yeah. 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 So it looks like, it still looks like a 356 to me. It looks like it's maybe slightly more stable, like they mix that with the air. Um, but there's the caps over the pieces, but there's like the caps clip underneath. So it looks like you can pop out the caps by just sort of pushing little plastic nubs in. I don't know what they call those, but you know how like when they're, there's like little clips that go into each other. Mm-hmm. It looks like you can push those out. And then there's also caps on top of that. And the so there's actual the embedded tiles like they have for the regular Rubik's Cube. Yeah. Um, Gan posted that that they're actually slightly frosted feeling. So I don't know. Mm. Everyone's been saying frosted cubes, but every frosted cube I've tried does not feel frosted. It just feels not like shiny. Um, yeah. But it looks decent. It comes with the yellow GES springs in it. Um, I saw an unboxing from Cubologist and, yeah, and he said it didn't come with a tension tool, but online Gan says that they will. So either it was hidden under the packaging or those ones didn't, but the ones that you can buy now will. So they're on, you can buy them for $18.99 from Gan's site. What I am wondering though, is if these are going to be sold at stores. Like I bought my Rubik's cube at Meyer, which if you... Meyer is like a local kind of Walmart type thing, but in Michigan, it's more of a Midwest yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, are they? Are you going to be able to buy a Gan cube at Meyer? <laughs> I honestly really hope so because, I mean, this might be a broad claim, and I know hardware isn't everything, mm-hmm. but I feel like if a cube is actually easy to turn, mm-hmm. people's attention won't get lost as much. Because if you don't know how to solve it, you pick up a cube or a, like a Rubik's Cube V2 at a store and it's really hard. You know, it's going to take some effort and some time. But if it's easier to turn mm-hmm. and, you know, it's actually not that expensive. I mean, obviously, a $19 is crazy compared to, you know, other things like a Guanlong. But I mean, the Vulk is $20. Yeah. So, um, I... I mean, this is obviously not the case, not the whole case at least, but I think that maybe people might get into it more if it's, you know, easier to turn and, and it's actually, you know, manageable. Yeah, especially if they see that it's a speed cube. Like, a lot of people I don't feel, like, even know that it's something that you would speed solve. Um, mm-hmm. So that might also influence people to check it out more. Yeah. 
but I really hope this is this comes in stores. So that would be really cool. Yeah, that's one of those things that I, I remember when they first teamed up. Everyone was kind of like, "Why? Why is Gan working with Rubik's? Because that's that seems like a downside for them. And why is Rubik's working with Gan? Because they didn't like those Chinese knockoffs." But if that yeah, if that goes in stores, one Gan got their way into local markets, um, and then Rubik's is becoming a a good possibly a good name in the speedcube community again which i honestly never felt it was a bad one but if you mm-hmm. if you go on any forums you'll you'll see people ranting about it yeah so okay i mean I, oh sorry, I mean, go oh um just i i mean if this is the first step i can just imagine in two three five years mm-hmm. you know the world champion using a rubik's blank you know <laughs> i would love to see that <laughs> that would be really cool so yeah, well, but. they had in that 1983 one where everyone was required to use, like, they brought the Rubik's Cubes that people would use. So mm-hmm. that, w- that would be maybe revert the entire world championship back to that, where they have to use their Rubik's brand and they use their, like, their sensor timers. We'll just <laughs> go back to the 80s version of it. Yeah. <laughs> that would actually, that would be exciting to watch. That would be interesting. Um, yeah get really like really fast people and give them like a 1980s rubik's cube yes <laughs> yeah that'd be that'd be pretty cool so we have a question from uh we'll go back to those from jack from washington and says hey well this one is more about a hardware question it says hey sean uh, you can answer this too or if you have some answers um do you take your cube everywhere you go i like to bring my cube around more but the yushiao is a little too big is there a nice mini cube that works really well and fits in the pocket well? So I've answered this in a different podcast. Um, before I do, do you have any mini puzzles that you have or use or bring around? I honestly don't think I have a mini cube. I have a big sale, but that's That's opposite. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I don't. Um, I I don't. I don't think I have any mini cubes. I used to have a mini Zantry, mm-hmm. but then I got ran, rid of that. Um, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't have any mini cubes, and like I think I said earlier, I don't really carry them around in public. So yeah, the so for what I would say, like there's kind of a few routes you can go about how many you want. Like the smallest one that I think is any decent at all is a Yushin keychain, and that's I think around thirty some cent. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I got two of them, so I could replace the corner that has a hole in it with mm-hmm. regular pieces. Um, then there's the 40 millimeter Cyclone Boys, which I think is like if you're going for one you can put in your pocket, that one's perfect. You cannot tension it. Well, I did a whole video on that because the core is really wonky. Um, oh, the 42, really? yeah, it's there's it's there's just a rod and then um, like a four. I don't know what to call it, but four of the axes are just connected to that one rod, but it's not like in the center like that it can slide back and forth. So when you uh-huh. put, when you put the pieces on, it stabilizes it, but it's, it's weird. That's, um, yeah. I'll, I'll link that video in the description. Cause that's a really weird one. The 42 okay. millimeter Zanchi is really cool. Like I, I get over 45 degree corner cutting on there. Um, but if you're going for a 50 millimeter, so, okay, there's a couple things The the only real 50 millimeter for a while was the Zanchi. Um, there was, a cube hinted at a mini Vulk. We have not seen anything yet, so I don't know what's going to happen with that. But I, I actually might be able to do the unboxing before um, this comes out. I think I'm going to. There's a new 50 millimeter puzzle from uh, Mofang from Moyu, the the Mofang uh, cubing classroom series. Mm. It almost looks like an MF3RS that's a 50 millimeter. So I'm mm. I'm really interested to check that out, but it depends on how small you want to go. That's just kind of smaller, but it's going to be nice. Yeah, I, I think if I did go with one, it would be that Cyclone Boys, just because it's small enough where you can put it in your pocket, but it, it works fairly well. And the color, you don't have that pink side like you do for Yushin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I feel like the the 42mm Zanchi, mm-hmm. like, I feel like it would be like uh kind of like the uh, the big sail. Where, like, it's huge, mm-hmm. but you can still finger trick it. Like, it's super tiny, but you can still finger trick it. Is that the case? Yeah, I actually used the 42 when I got into one-handed. Um, have you, have mm. you ever... Do you solve one-handed? Yeah, uh, I don't really do it competitively, but I practice here and there. 
The hardest thing for me, I feel like, was just getting my hands used to turning the sides. And using a full-size cube, just, like, I felt it was so clunky. So I used the 42 millimeter to get the basic movements down. And then I went to the 50 millimeter, And then I went to, um, I suppose, one the other ones after that. And so it got... It was a good one to start with. And actually, oh, I forgot. There's a 46 millimeter Shang Show, the Shang Show Ling Long. Um, and that's really mm. good. It's, it's, I mean, it's sort of an old Shang Show design, almost like the Aurora was. But I, I think if it was between the Shang Show and the Zanchi, I would use the Shang Show one just because it's really smooth and it, it flows well. Um, mm. But I'm hoping to get some new stickers so it actually looks nicer. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so we have another question from Joseph from Pennsylvania. There's only a couple of questions left actually no i'm going to save that one from joseph for the end um so yeah we have three we have three left we have uh, adrian from ontario um how it says how do you learn full you method for before i'm guessing that's yao um i so i i've got an answer for this but i'll kind of um i'll kind of change the question what how do you solve four by four uh, I solve with Yao, mm -hmm. um, and so basically I'll kind of explain it briefly for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, so what you do is you solve two opposite centers. So I do white and yellow. Mm -hmm. Then I choose uh, white as my kind of primary uh, center, and I build three, uh, three edges around that. So it would be, for example, the white and blue, the white and red, and the white and green. Now, the nice thing about that is that you don't have any other centers built other than those two. So you don't have to do this slice back thing and fix everything. So then you do that, and then you solve the other centers, and then you solve edges, and then you solve it like a three by three. But you skip the cross. So um, I, I do everything like a normal Yao user would use, until the uh, edge pairing, which still might be the same, which is I do like a, um, I think it's like a three two 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 three method or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, or no, I do it'd more just be like three two three. I think because it's it, like when people say three two 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 three, whatever it'd be is when they don't have the cross done. Oh really? I think so. Cause yeah, when cause that would be. Um... Well, I mean there is uh, there's twenty pieces. And then on a three by three, eight of them, so twelve edges. Mm -hmm. So if it's so if you already have uh, so if you already have four edges done, that's eight. So three would be three, two would be five, and then three would be eight. Yeah, so it'd be a three two three. But uh, I don't really do the three at the end because I kind of don't know how to do that. So I kind of do like a three two, two if somehow I don't know. But um, yeah, I do like. No, I do like a four two two. Or I, don't know. <laughs> I I it just happens. I solve it. It it gets solved eventually. My my common response when, when people ask about Yao and, and Hoyas is, is it's it's the exact same thing as reduction, really. You're just moving a couple steps around. So you're finishing pairing um three of the cross edges before you do the centers, which, you know, it's nice because you don't have to you're saying you don't have to like slice back. You don't even have to um, worry about those centers at all then you finish those centers and pair up one last edge and i think honestly the the biggest thing is is getting that last edge and being efficient with it because i've seen i've yeah. done personally some weird things where i like i feel like it could have been done in three moves and i do it in like 17 to get that final <laughs> edge that cross edge in there <laughs> um but yeah i don't i mean because there's not any new algorithms really to learn for yao it's just yeah. it's just not like it's solving the the final centers without messing up those three edges, which I would do a lot when I started out as well. Yeah. So we have... Which, uh, oops, sorry, go on. Uh, what I really like about Yao is that it's mostly intuitive. And by mostly, you know, it's like pretty much intuitive, but one algorithm, not including parity. Mm -hmm. Because parity is, you know, just a thing with 4x4. Four four. Because really, everything is intuitive except if you get... Uh, the the last two edges you're making flipped, mm -hmm. but you you would still get that with reduction. So it's literally no more algorithms than you would get with reduction. Plus, once you get the edges done, you have cross already done. Yeah. So it, I mean, it's a win-win right there. Yeah. 
Uh, we've got a question from, this is sort of a similar thing with algorithms, Seth from Ontario. It says, do you know all algorithms for CFOP? So I'm guessing that means, do you know full OLL and PLL? Because personally, I don't really consider F2L as algorithmic. I see that as very yeah. intuitive. <laughs> and I've, I've said this multiple times. If you're just learning the algorithms, you are actually learning some very inefficient ways of pairing pieces yes. up. So actually, do you know full OLL and PLL? Uh, I know full PLL, and I know about close to half full OLL. I need to learn full OLL, but uh, I put that on hold because I'm currently on a quest of square one. I'm trying to get top like 50 in the US in square one. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning all square one algs right now. So uh, eventually I will learn full OLL, but yeah. I do not do square square ugh, square one. I have tried it. I just don't like it. I don't know what it is about it. Uh, it might be just like doing the algs. I just I I want like a cube where it you you know it's back to a cube shape before you do the next turn. You it, but with square one, it's like okay, I need I need to go ninety degrees this way and then like oh, it's rough for me yeah. at least. Yeah, for me, I am, so I have no full OLL and PLL, and then this is something I'll probably do a video on at some point where, you know, what, what do you do next? And one thing I did was I just started looking at other people's OLLs and PLLs, and there's some, like, mm. for the world record, the, um, the OLL that Felix used is, like, the beginning of a Y perm, so it's like, I'm going to put a cube in front of me so I can remember this, it's like F, and then R, U prime, R prime U, R, oh shoot, what is it? I don't know what, <laughs> uh, no, that, it's like R U prime, R prime U prime, R U, R prime, F prime, something like that. But anyways, and mm -hmm. what I, what I was doing for it, for that same OLL was, um, I did sort of a, I think it's hedge slammer, reverse sexy move where it's, like F R prime F prime R and then U R U prime R prime and it it solved the same OLL but what I found out is that if I do Felix's one it solves with a different it it could be a it could solve PLL with a certain color combination like I I mean I mm -hmm. guess it's a one look L I don't know if it's Z no it's not ZBLL so yeah it's a uh, one look L uh, is it COLL it or... wouldn't even be that because the crop the um the cross isn't done. So it oh. it's just considered a one look last layer elk. So <laughs> I learned his and then I still had my old one and the color um the color the patterns you're able to see are actually really simple on both of those. So oh. depending on what I get, I I now have some one look last layer algs. And that same thing happened for like the H cases. Um the oil that looks like an H. I learned one elk and then I tried it left-handed, and then I saw someone else's, and so there's a few different cases that I suddenly learned some one-look last layer cases just because I tried different OLLs. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did I learned some winter and some C O L L, and I'm kind of doing the the big ones that are easiest to recognize, like the winter variation that's just one corner twisted, or the C O L Ls that are just um, yeah. four corner twisted. So those are easiest I think to recognize. So I don't know. It's for me. I think if you set a goal of like I'm gonna learn all OLL, I'm gonna learn it in a week. Like no, don't don't try that. Yeah, just, just yeah. learn as you go. And if you like for this, I could probably keep learning some more C OLLs right now. Like maybe do the soon cases, but I don't know. I'm gonna take a little break for a few weeks and just make sure these are drilled down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the probably the best advice I could give you for learning algs, anybody that's watching, um, is I mean take this with a grain of salt because I don't know full OLL. But, um, <laughs> but I just pace yourself and I w it's a lot better to learn an alg, one alg in like three days and know it down than learn like 10 in three days mm -hmm. because I've personally done that. I've rushed through it. I've learned like five and then the next day I know maybe one and then I don't even practice that one, move on to something else and I forget that one. So my time is dedicated into something and then it just disappears. So, um, one thing, one thing that I have learned that I don't know if this is an original idea or I got it from someone, but learn an OLL and then set it up, put it on your desk and then go to sleep 
the next morning, s- see if you can solve that all out. Because if you just say, oh, yeah, I, you know, I understand how it works, and then done. That's not – because you have to memorize it. You can't just learn it. You have to fully memorize it. So that's what I do. I, mm-hmm. I, get, an, I get an OLL. I, I practice it a couple times, maybe like five. Then I kind of set it down, set it up. The next time I, time I come to my desk, I do it. And now I've got a new OLL. I just learned that a couple days ago. So um, that works for me, and I, I kind of uh, encourage you, you to do that because it's very simple. doesn't take much time. And it's easy ways to learn Alex. So, yeah, for me, my biggest tip is to just experiment with one Alex and see what happens with it. Like, for example, I don't know which one I learned first, but like there was an Alex for I think it was the the one of the P shape cases, mm. and it was like R prime U prime F, and then reverse X. So it was like U R U prime R prime, and then F prime R. So you don't have to memorize what I just said right there. But that set up like one of the large uh, lightning or zigzag cases. So if I do that same alg backwards, so doing like R prime F, R U R prime, and then F prime U R. So I did the exact same alg backwards. I now solved that case. So now I have two OLLs. And then if I do it with my left Mm -hmm. hand, there's now... Th- four more algorithms so i've learned four ols with only one alg i just did it reverse and people's complaint with that is you know i'm doing using my left hand and they don't want to use their left hand but actually i find that humorous that the big issue people have with using the left hand is it's not as strong as your right hand but then everyone says use your left hand for oh because the algs you don't have to memorize new algs like wait but your argument oh no that's a whole other time i'll t- <laughs> yeah. um okay yeah. so i've got one more question um and i'll kind of do my answer first with this uh joseph from pennsylvania and his question says how to be good at cube at cube tubing at, at how to get i guess the channel going so my first my main response whenever people ask me about youtube and cubing is that make videos for yourself like make things because yeah. the videos I have made are ones that I feel like, um, you know, I I would like to see. I've made ones that I was like, oh, there's there's either not a video for this or not a good explanation or not one that I like. Um, I usually try to avoid videos that are unnecessary. I mean, I've done a couple where I'm like, oh, people are asking for it, I'll do it, even though they don't. It doesn't need to be out there. But make videos for yourself because. Yeah. For me, like, the reason I feel like my channel took off so much faster than, um, I mean, there's some people, like, like, Jay Perm's channel is great, and he knows what he's talking about, and his, he's taken off really fast. Um, but I think one thing for mine is that, like, I'm older, so people are like, oh, he must know what he's talking about. <laughs> I have yeah. no idea a lot of the time. So, um, so it, if you worry about subscribers getting to a certain point or doing, you're just going to be constantly frustrated that, you know, because mm. you can't. You can't really cheat the system. You can't, um, I mean, even, yeah, there, you just, I guess, look at your own videos and be, and ask yourself, would I want to watch this? Would I want to watch my own video? Is the sound good? And the biggest thing, most people's cameras, if you use a phone camera, that's, I use a phone camera for, I would say more than half my videos are a phone camera, but I make sure the lighting's good because if it's dark, it's going to be grainy. So, um, I guess on, on your front, then, what do you have any tips for people that are getting into YouTube, or I guess how what's a big thing that you felt helped yourself out? I mean, really, what I did is I kind of took what I did for fun and my knowledge of what I did for fun and put it on the internet. So my first video was a Yushin Fire uh, review because I I spent some time trying it out. I kind of knew how it was, and I, I wanted to put that on the internet and say, hey, this is how it is. Is this for you, or is it not? And if you're a cuber and you constantly get cubes, there you've got some videos. Make some unboxings. You just set up a camera. Um, if you don't have a tripod, maybe lean it up against something so it's maybe facing towards you. I mean, there's no really black and white way to do an unboxing. So if you're like, oh, I don't have a tripod. I can't do an unboxing. That's not true. You can set it up. You can you can have it where it's facing you, and you know you're unboxing it from that angle. So I guess just use your cubing to your advantage. 
whether you got a new cube or you're going to a competition, you want to show your mains and goals, or um, you had an experience that you wanted to tell people about or stuff like that. I mean, use whatever your hobby is to your advantage. And I mean, there really is no wrong answer for a video. You know, everybody, you know, there's so many different ways and so many different things to record. I mean, there's, I mean, it's YouTube. You can, there's limitless things you can do. Yeah. But like I, especially with cubing. Yeah. Like I have, I have uh, hundreds of videos at this point, but I have deleted a lot of videos. I have deleted not ones that have already gone published, but like I've made them. There's some videos I've made three or four times and then just finally I was like, I'm just, I can't, I need to just, like there's one video, I I think I recorded three separate videos, I spent hours editing it, it was a video going over um, what is ZBLL, what is uh, like EL, like what are these things and what my thoughts on them, but I made a few videos and I was, I I just didn't like any of them so I just scrapped them. I have a video, I think it's actually still um, unlisted on my channel that's a Megaminx tutorial on how to solve it and Mm. i made it i didn't like it i asked a few people if they'd check it out and um some people like oh it seems fine and some people like yeah i kind of see what you mean like it just it was very it didn't flow well and so i just i've never released it because i personally didn't like it um Mm -hmm. and and yeah it's there is Oh, I was trying to think. I, I had some stuff planned. I was going to say it. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> um, that I don't know. It's oh yeah. You're talking about as far as just there's different ways of of even how the camera can be. There's been a few videos I've done recently, and I'm planning to do more where it's more of a um, camera facing at me, me chatting at the camera. I've you know I'll, I'll add some extra footage of me messing around with the cube or the pieces, but. Like, there's not a lot of cubers that are doing where their cameras are sort of facing them in the way that I am, um, where it's it's almost like uh, Philip DeFranco. Like, that's that's how I'm kind of, um, like, I don't know if you know who that is. He's been on YouTube for, like, I don't know, a decade almost yeah. at this point. And he does news, and he does, um, but it, it's very almost personal, and that's... Mm-hmm. So that's my new thing. I was like, I don't know, let's let's do that. Not many people are doing it, and it seems fun to do. I'm not doing it to like see if I can get more subscribers or views. Like, no, it's just mm-hmm. I I enjoyed, it. and actually, it's been easier. It's been nice to make because it, it's literally a most of the time it's a webcam that I've set up, and um, but yeah. So I guess have fun with it is the biggest thing. Don't worry about. I mean, there, there's people who've been doing it for a lot longer, and it's like someone getting into reviewing games or just making random stuff and being upset that they don't have as many subscribers as PewDiePie. Like it's, yeah, it's not going to happen pretty much like JR keepers way out yeah. there. I'm not, my goal is not to catch up to him. He does his own thing. He does a good job. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean, if you, fi- if you find your, if you find your niche, people will, people will come to you. I mean, with cubing being such a small community, like gamers, if you're a gaming YouTuber, there's so many game gaming youtubers where the audience is saying well this person has 10 10 million subscribers what is special about you but with cubing it's so small that it's quite easy and easy to get an audience and it's a really cool community that you know it's it's really easy to con- to connect with people because you know with cubing other than gaming People that like different genres of gaming. With cubing, you all have the same hobby, and you can get that audience and kind of connect with them, which is also a really cool thing about you know uh, uh, doing YouTube. Yeah, and I found what what sort of helped me the most is well, what helps I guess any channel is pe- other people sharing your content. Um, and so, like I've seen on Facebook, somebody asked about a good blind tutorial, and someone linked my blind tutorial and said, "Oh, this is one that I like." And um, so. That way other people have already gotten out there and done that. But, like, there was someone, Riley, I can't remember what his channel name was, but he did a lot of just sort of vlogging where it was just him with his phone chatting with it. And, um, like, a lot of people really liked that because it was just, it was kind of different. His personality was different. He's not doing it anymore. But, but yeah, I guess that's sort of my thoughts on it. The biggest thing is just have fun. Don't care how many subscribers you have because do it for yourself. Yeah. 
But I think that's going to wrap things up. Thank you very much. I'm going to have a link to your uh, channel in the description. Check it out. Subscribe. And speaking of YouTube, yeah, go to the channel and subscribe. <laughs> um, oh, that's one thing I was going to say, actually, before I do. So I did – I can't remember what you called it, but you had sort of a YouTube a podcast kind of thing. And, um, like, people almost daily ask me to do, like, collaborations and stuff like that. And, like, yours was different because it felt professional it felt like you you didn't have many subscribers, but it it felt like like you actually were trying to make quality content. And I think part of it too, because you you lived in Michigan, I was like, okay, we're you know it's, it's a little bit closer to. Um, yeah. But but I mean, I I you know I did your did the podcast thing because you actually were trying to make good content. Actually, you made like a whole. Yeah list of topics we're going to talk about so i could pre-research them which is more than what i did for this so i apologize on that <laughs> no it's no problem i remember from you know my podcast that uh you know i wanted to give the the guest the you know kind of what we were going to talk about and i didn't i didn't want to come on your podcast and you know you start talking about worlds and you know i'll, I'll be honest before we before this podcast i didn't I, I knew about the timer malfunction. I mm -hmm. didn't look at it. I didn't knew, know who it was, but I, I looked into it and I did my research so I could actually hold a conversation and stuff. So, you know, I just did that. So Yeah, hopefully a half hour before this be telling you that it wasn't the time. but <laughs> It's totally fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was super fun. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So I'd like to thank Cuber Cubed one more time for being on the podcast. Check out his channel. I'll put a link in the description to the YouTube video. If you're on YouTube, make sure to hit like and subscribe. If you're on iTunes, please go and leave a review. It greatly helps the show out. You can always go to speedcubereview.com slash podcast to submit questions, as well as enter the giveaway. This week is for the 2x2x3 Tower Cube from Cheeky. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next time.